Section 10 of the Good Dog Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne B. Sweet 13. Scally, the Story of a Perfect Gentleman, Part 1 by Ian Hay. Division 1. Better see Trump? Right, miss. My wife, who has been married long enough to feel deeply gratified at being mistaken for a maiden lady, smiled seraphically at the conductor, and allowed herself to be hoisted up the steps of the majestic vehicle provided by a paternal county council to convey passengers. At a loss to the ratepayers, I understand, from the embankment to Battersea. Presently, we ground our way round a curve and begin to cross Westminster Bridge. The conductor, whose innate cockney bonhomie his high official position had failed to eradicate, presented himself before us and collected our fares. "'What part of better seat did you require, sir?' he asked of me. I coughed and answered evasively. <coughs> uh, about the middle. "'We haven't been there before,' added my wife, quite gratuitously. The conductor smiled indulgently and punched our tickets. I'll tell you when to get down, he said, and left us. For some months we had been considering the question of buying a dog, and a good deal of our spare time, or perhaps I should say of my spare time, for a woman's time is naturally all her own, had been pleasantly occupied in discussing the matter. Having at length committed ourselves to the purchase of the animal, we proceeded to consider such details as breed, sex, and age. My wife vacillated between a bloodhound, because bloodhounds are so aristocratic in appearance, and a Pekingese, because they are dernier cri. We like to be dernier cri, even in much more ham. Her younger sister, Aline, who spends a good deal of time with us, having no parents of her own, suggested an old English sheepdog, explaining that it would be company for my wife when I was away from home. I coldly recommended a mastiff. Our son John, age three, on being consulted, expressed the preference for twelve tigers in a box, and was not again invited to participate in the debate. Finally, we decided on an Alberdeen Terrier, of an age and sex to be settled by circumstances, and I was instructed to communicate with a gentleman in the north, who advertised in our morning paper that Aberdeen Terriers were his specialty. In due course, we received a reply. The advertiser recommended two animals, namely Celtic Chief, aged four months, and Scotia's Pride, aged one year. Pedigrees were enclosed, each about as complicated as the family tree of the House of Hasburg, and the favor of an early reply was requested, as both dogs were being hotly bid for by an anonymous client in Constantinople. The price of Celtic Chief was twenty guineas, that of Scotia's Pride, for reasons heavily underlined in the pedigree, was twenty-seven. The advertiser, who resided in Aberdeen, added that these prices did not cover cost of carriage. We decided not to stand in the way of the gentleman in Constantinople, and, having sent back the pedigree by return of post, resumed the debate. Finally, Stella, my wife, said, We don't really want a dog with a pedigree. We only want something that will bark at beggars, and be gentle with baby. Why not go to the home for lost dogs at Battersea? I believe you can get any dog you like there for five shillings. We will run up to town next Wednesday and see about it, and I might get some clothes as well. Hence our presence on the tram. Presently the conductor, who had kindly pointed out to us such objects of local interest as the River Thames and the Houses of Parliament, stopped the tram in a crowded thoroughfare and announced that we were in Battersea. A light here, he announced facetiously, for own for lost dogs. Guiltily realizing that there is many a true word spoken in jest, we obeyed him, and the tram went rocking and whizzing out of sight. We had eschewed a cab. When you are only going to pay five shillings for a dog, my wife had pointed out with convincing logic, it is silly to go and pay perhaps another five shillings for a cab. It doubles the price of the dog at once. If we had been buying an expensive dog, we might have taken a cab, 
but not for a five-shilling one. Now, I inquired briskly, how are we going to find this place? Haven't you any idea where it is? No, I have a sort of vague notion that it is on an island in the middle of the river, called the Isle of Dogs, or Barking Reach, or something like that. However, I have no doubt. Hadn't we better ask someone? suggested Stella. I demurred. If there is one thing I dislike, I said, it is accosting total strangers and badgering them for information they don't possess. Not that that will prevent them from giving it. If we start asking the way, we shall find ourselves in Putney or Woolwich in no time. Yes, dear, said Stella soothingly. Now I suggest... My hand went to my pocket. No, darling, interposed my wife hastily. Not a map, please. It is a curious psychological fact that women have a constitutional aversion to maps and railroad timetables. They would rather consult a half-witted errand boy or a deaf railroad porter. Do not let us make a spectacle of ourselves in the public streets again. I have not yet forgotten the day when you tried to find the Crystal Palace. Besides, it will only blow away. Ask that dear little boy there. He is looking at us so wistfully. Yes, I admit it was criminal folly. A man who asks a London street boy to be so kind as to direct him to a home for lost dogs has only himself to thank for the consequence. The wistful little boy smiled up at us. He had a pinched face and large eyes. Lost dogs home, sir? He said courteously. It's a good long way. Do you want to get there quick? Yes. Then if I was you, sir, replied the infant, edging to the mouth of an alleyway, I should bite a policeman. And with an ear-splitting yell, he vanished. Ah! We walked on, hot-faced. Little wretch, said Stella. We simply asked for it, I rejoined. What are we going to do next? My question was answered in a most incredible fashion, for at this moment a man emerged from a shop on our right and set off down the street before us. He wore a species of uniform, and emblazoned on the front of his hat was the information that he was an official of the Battersea Home for Lost and Starving Dogs. Wait a minute, and I will ask him, I said, starting forward. But my wife would not hear of it. Certainly not, she replied. If we ask him, he will simply offer to show us the way. Then we will have to talk to him. About hydrophobia and lethal chambers and distemper. And it may be for miles. I simply couldn't bear it. We shall have to tip him, too. Let us follow him quietly. To those who have never attempted to track a fellow creature surreptitiously through the streets of London on a hot day, the feat may appear simple. It is in reality a most exhausting, dilatory, and humiliating exercise. Our difficulty lay not so much in keeping our friend in sight as in avoiding frequent and unexpected collisions with him. The general idea, as they say on field days, was to keep about twenty yards behind him, but under certain circumstances distance has an uncanny habit of annihilating itself. The man himself was no hustler. Once or twice he stopped to light his pipe or converse with a friend. During these interludes, Stella and I loafed guiltily on the pavement, pointing out to one another objects of local interest, with the fascist officiousness of people in the foreground of hotel advertisements. Occasionally, he paused to contemplate the contents of a shop window. We gazed industriously into the window next door. Our first window, I recollect, was an undertaker's, with ready printed expressions of grief for sale on white porcelain discs. We had time to read them all. The next was a butcher's. Here we stayed perforce, so long that the proprietor, who was of the tribe that disposes of its wares almost entirely by personal canvas, came out into the street and endeavored to sell us a bullock's heart. Our quarry's next proceeding was to dive into a public house. We turned and surveyed one another. What are we to do now? inquired my wife. Go inside too. I replied with more enthusiasm than I had hitherto displayed. At least I think I ought to. You can please yourself. I will not be left in the street, said Stella firmly. We must just wait here together until he comes out. 
There may be another exit, I objected. We had better go in. I shall take something, just to keep up appearances. And you must sit down in the ladies' bar, or the snug, or whatever they call it. Certainly not, said Stella. We had arrived at this impasse when the man suddenly reappeared, wiping his mouth. Instantly and silently we fell in behind him. For the first time the man appeared to notice our presence. He regarded us curiously, with a faint gleam of recognition in his eyes, and then set off down the street at a good pace. We followed, panting. Once or twice he looked back over his shoulder, a little apprehensively, I thought, but we ploughed on. We ought to get there soon at this pace. I gasped. Hello? He's gone again. He turned down to the right, said Stella excitedly. The lust of the chase was fairly on us now. We swung eagerly round the corner into a quiet by street. Our man was nowhere to be seen, and the street was almost empty. Come on, said Stella. He may have turned in somewhere. We hurried down the street. Suddenly, Warned by a newly awakened and primitive instinct, I looked back. We had overrun our quarry. He had just emerged from some hiding place and was heading back toward the main street, looking fearfully over his shoulder. Once more, we were in full cry. For the next five minutes, we practically ran, all three of us. The man was obviously frightened out of his wits and kept making frenzied and spasmodic spurts from which we surmised that he was getting to the end of his powers of endurance. If only we could overtake him, I said, hauling my exhausted spouse along by the arm. We could explain that. He's gone again, exclaimed Stella. She was right. The man had turned another corner. We followed him round Hutfoot and found ourselves in a prim little cul-de-sac with villas on each side across the end of the street ran a high wall obviously screening a railroad track we've got him i exclaimed i felt as maltka must have felt when he closed the circle at sedan but where is the dog's home dear inquired stella the question was never answered for at this moment the man ran up the steps of the fourth villa on the left and slipped a latch-key into the lock the door closed behind him with a venomous snap and we were left alone in the street guideless and dogless a minute later the man appeared at the ground floor window accompanied by a female of commanding appearance he pointed us out to her behind them we could dimly descry a white tablecloth a tea cosy and covered dishes the commanding female after a prolonged and withering glare plucked a hairpin from her head and ostentatiously proceeded to skewer together the starchy white curtains that framed the window privacy secured and the sanctity of the english home thus pointedly vindicated she and her husband disappeared into the murky background where they doubtless sat down to an excellent high tea exhausted and discomfited we drifted away i am going home said stella in a hollow voice and i think she added bitterly that it might have occurred to you to suggest that the creature might possibly be going from the dog's home and not to it I apologized. It is the simplest plan, really. Division 2 It was almost dark when the train arrived at our little country station. We set out to walk home by the short cut across the golf course. Anyhow, we have saved five shillings, remarked Stella. We paid half a crown for that taxi which took us back to Victoria Station, I reminded her. Do not argue tonight, darling, responded my wife. I simply cannot endure anything more. Plainly, she was a little unstrung. Very considerately, I selected another topic. I think our best plan, I said cheerfully, would be to advertise for a dog. I never wish to see a dog again, replied Stella. I surveyed her with some concern and said gently, I'm afraid you are tired, dear. No, I'm not. A little shaken, perhaps? Nothing of that kind. Joe, what is that? Stella's fingers bit deep into my biceps muscle causing me considerable pain we were passing a small sheet of water which guards the thirteenth green on the golf course it is a stagnant and unclean pool but we make rather a fuss of it we call it the pond and if you play a ball into it you send a blasphemous caddy in after it and count one stroke a young moon was struggling up over the trees dismally illuminating the scene on the slimy shores of the pond we beheld a small moving object a yard behind it was another object a little smaller 
moving at exactly the same pace one of the objects was emitting sounds of distress abandoning my quaking consort i advanced to the edge of the pond and leaned down to investigate the mystery the leading object proved to be a small wet shivering whimpering puppy the satellite was a brick the two were connected by a string the puppy had just emerged from the depths of the pond towing the brick behind it what is it dear repeated stella fearfully your dog i replied and cut the string division three we spent three days deciding on a name for him stella suggested tiny on account of his size i pointed out that time might stellify this selection of a title i don't think so said aline supporting her sister that kind of dog does not grow very big what kind of dog is he i inquired swiftly aline said no more there are problems that even girls of twenty cannot solve a warm bath had revealed to us the fact that the puppy was of a dingy yellow hue i suggested that we call him mustard our son john on being consulted against my advice by his mother addressed the animal as pussy stella continued to favor tiny finally aline who was at the romantic age produced a copy of tennyson and suggested escalabar alleging in support of her preposterous proposition that it rose from out the bottom of the lake the darling rose from out the bottom of the lake too just like the sword escalabar she said so i think it would make a lovely name for him the little brute wadded out of a muddy pond towing a brick i replied i see no parallel he was not the product of the pond someone must have thrown him in and he came out that is just what someone must have done with the sword retorted aline so we'll call you a scalabar won't we darling little scally she embraced the puppy warmly and the unsuspecting animal replied by frantically licking her face however the name stuck with variations when the puppy was big enough he was presented with a collar engraved with the name escalabar together with my name and address among ourselves we usually addressed him as scally the children in the village called him the scallywag his time during his first year in our household was fully occupied in growing up stella declared that if one could have persuaded him to stand still for five minutes it would have been actually possible to see him grow he grew at the rate of about an inch a week for the best part of a year when he had finished he looked like nothing on earth at one time we cherished a brief but illusionary hope that he was going to turn into some sort of an imitation of a saint bernard but the symptoms rapidly passed off and his final and permanent aspect was that of a rather badly stuffed lion like most overgrown creatures he was top-heavy and lethargic and very humble-minded still there was a kind of respectful pertinacity about him it requires some strength of character for instance to wade along the bottom of a pond to dry land accompanied by a brick as big as yourself it was quite impossible too short of locking him up to prevent him from accompanying us when we took our walks abroad if he had made up his mind to do so the first time this happened i was going to shoot with my neighbors the hoods it was only a mile to the first covert and i set off after breakfast to walk i was hardly out on the road when a scalaver was beside me ambling uncertainly on his weedy legs and smiling up into my face with an air of imbecile affection you have many qualities old friend i said but i don't think you are a sporting dog go home escalibur sat down on the road with a dejected air then having given me fifty yards start he rose and crawled sheepishly after me i stopped called him up pointed him with some difficulty in the required direction gave him a resounding spank and bade him be gone he responded by collapsing like a camp bedstead and i left him two minutes later i looked round escalaver was ten yards behind me propelling himself along on his stomach this time i thrashed him severely after he began to howl i let him go and he lumbered away homeward the picture of misery in due course i reached the crossroads where i had arranged to meet the rest of the party they had not arrived but escalaver had he had made a detour and headed me off not certain which route i would take after reaching the crossroads he was sitting very sensibly under the signpost awaiting my arrival on seeing me he immediately came forward wagging his tail and placed himself at my feet in the position most convenient to me for inflicting chastisement i wonder how many of our human friends would be willing to pay such a price for the pleasure of our company 
as time went on escalibur filled out into one of the most terrifying spectacles i have ever beheld in one respect though he lived up to his knightly name his manners were of the most courtly description and he had an affectionate greeting for all beggars included he was particularly fond of children if he saw children in the distance he would canter up and offer to play with them if the children had not met him before they would run shrieking to their nurses if they had they would fall on escalibur in a body and roll him over and pull him about on wet afternoons in the nursery my own family used to play a dentist with him assigning to escalibur the role of patient gas was administered with a bicycle pump and a shoehorn and button hook were employed in place of the ordinary instruments of torture but escalibur did not mind he lay on his back on the hearth rug with the principal dentist sitting astride his ribs as happy as a king he was particularly attracted by babies and being able by reason of his stature to look right down into perambulators he was accustomed whenever he met one of those vehicles to amble alongside and peer inquiringly into the face of its occupant most of the babies in the district got to know him in time but until they did we had a good deal of correspondence to attend on the subject escalibar's intellect may have been lofty but his memory was treacherous our household will never forget the day on which he was given the shoulder of mutton one morning after breakfast aline accompanied by escalibur intercepted the kitchen-maid hastening in the direction of the potting shed carrying the joint in question at arm's length the damsel explained that its premature maturity was due to the recent warm weather and that she was even now in search of the gardener's boy who would be commissioned to perform the duties of sexton it seems a waste miss observed the kitchen-maid but cook says it can't be ate no how now loud but respectable snuffings from escalibar moved a direct negative to the statement aline and the kitchen-maid who were both criminally weak when escalibar was concerned saw a way to gratify their economical instincts and their natural affection simultaneously the next moment escalibar was searching contentedly down the gravel path with a presentation shoulder of mutton in his mouth then joy day began escalibur took his prize into the middle of the tennis lawn it was a very large shoulder of mutton but escalibur finished it in ten minutes after that descended to his utmost limits he went to sleep in the sun with the bone between his paws occasionally he woke up and raising his head stared solemnly into space in the attitude of a trafalgar square lion the bone now lay white and gleaming on the grass beside him then he fell asleep again about four o'clock he roused himself and began to look for a suitable place of interment for the bone by four thirty the deed was done and he went to sleep once more at five he woke up and pandemonium began he could not remember where he had buried the bone he started systematically with the rose beds but met with no success after that he tried two or three shrubberies without avail and then embarked on a frantic but thorough excavation of the tennis lawn we were taking tea on the lawn at the time and our attention was first drawn to escalibur's bereavement by a temporary but unshakable conviction on his part that the bone was buried immediately underneath the tea-table as the tennis lawn was fast beginning to resemble a golf course we locked escalibur up in the wash-house where his hyena-like howls rent the air for the rest of the evening penetrating even to the dining-room this was particularly unfortunate because we were having a dinner party in honor of a neighbor who had recently come to the district no less a personage in fact than the new lord lieutenant of the county and his lady stella was naturally anxious that there should be no embarrassments on such an occasion and it distressed her to think that these people should imagine that we kept a private torture chamber on the premises however dinner passed off quite successfully and we adjourned to the drawing-room it was a chilly september evening and lady wickham was accommodated with a seat by the fire in a large armchair with a cushion at her back when the gentlemen came in aline sang to us fortunately the drawing-room is out of range of the wash-house during aline's first song i sat by lady wickham her expression was one of patrician calm and well-bred repose but it seemed to me she was not looking quite comfortable i was not feeling quite comfortable myself the atmosphere seemed a trifle oppressive perhaps we had done wrong in having a fire after all lady wickham appeared to notice it too she sat very upright fanning herself mechanically and seemed disinclined to lean back in her chair after the song was finished i said 
I am afraid you are not comfortable, Lady Wickham. Let me get you a larger cushion. Thank you, said Lady Wickham. The cushion I have is delightfully comfortable, but I think there is something hard behind it apologetically i plucked away the cushion lady wickham was right there was something behind it it was a scalibur's bone End of section ten